Hello everyone. Today we welcome uh, Dr. Peter Glick, a world-renowned uh, water expert and co-founder of Think Tank, the Pacific Institute. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Peter. Thank you for having me on. Uh, since the 1980s, many of our viewers uh, will be aware the Pacific Institute has managed a database and we'll provi provide links to um, all um, relevant data that's mentioned in this conversation. Um, a database of cases where water has been a trigger um, for fighting, um, used as a weapon or uh, been disrupted by human conflict. It's a fascinating read. It goes back some 5,000 years. Uh, I recommend it as a, 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 an interesting, uh, fascinating piece of research. But, Peter, the, um, the chronology, the water conflict chronology has attracted particular interest recently because you report that incidents of water-related violence have doubled um, in the last 10 years, which is, which is startling. What's going on? Yes, well, thank you for raising this important topic. Uh, as you mentioned, the Pacific Institute for many years has looked at the issue of conflicts over freshwater resources, violence associated with freshwater resources. Uh, the Institute looks at global water problems in general, but this particular project, the water conflict chronology, has looked throughout history at the way that water has been related to violence in three forms, uh, where water has been a trigger of conflict, as in, I want your water, uh, where water has been a weapon actually used in conflicts that may start for political or religious or economic or ideological reasons, but, but where water or water systems have been a weapon. Uh, and the third category is where water systems have been a casualty, a target, a victim of conflicts that start, again, for, for other reasons. And as you mentioned, the bad news is, even though the data go back many thousands of years, there's been a very sharp increase in the number of instances that we've put into this database uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, violence over water, violence caused by water, violence on water systems themselves. We, we've seen a big uptick in those number of entries. We sometimes um, read in um, media somewhat lurid headlines, attention grabbers about the next wars, uh, the century's wars being about water rather than oil. Um, are you of the school of thought that we should be ringing that alarm bell as in the media or, or, or is it a bit more uh, nuanced? Is the phrase water wars useful or, or less helpful? Well, I have two feelings about that. I, I'm not a fan of the water wars description. Uh, wars are very complex things, of course. Every war that you can think about has started for multiple reasons. Uh, because of the failure of diplomacy, because of religious or political or economic reasons. Um, the way I tend to think about this, the way we tend to think about this at the Institute, is that water is increasingly uh, in influencing, contributing to tensions and conflicts. Um, if you get a war, obviously a lot of things have gone wrong already. Uh, but we are seeing more and more instances of violence where water is a piece of the problem. Uh, in the Middle East, which I, I'm sure we'll talk about a little more. Of course, conflict has been prevalent for many, many decades, for centuries, for, for thousands of years. But we do see water as an influence, as a component of these kinds of conflicts. And uh, again, the bad news is that in the last decade or so, those instances have been on the rise. You, well, you mentioned the Middle East, your um, research and the recent spikes are particularly uh, noticeable in the Middle East, in the North African Sahel, in India. And, and these are also geographies which we know are particularly um, hit by, um, by, by uh, climate change effects. Is the, are these spikes related to climate change? There's a lot going on here, though, too, isn't there? There's, there's human migration patterns, there's urbanization, there's economic development. Um, are, are these separate factors or is this all linked? Well, that's a, another excellent question. I, I'm actually a climate scientist in part by training. Uh, we do a lot of work looking at the connections between water and human-caused climate change, which are very strong, I would note, very strong connections. As the climate changes, we see very dramatic impacts happening, and we expect even more dramatic impacts to continue to happen uh, associated with the way we're changing the climate. 
But again, climate is just a piece of this puzzle. And if we take climate out of the picture for a second uh, and think about the kinds of, of conflicts that we've seen, uh, we see conflicts associated with water scarcity alone. Again, going back, back for thousands of years where there simply isn't enough water to meet all of the demands that humans place on a water system. And when water is scarce, because water is so important to everything we care about, we sometimes see violence. And that's true in the Middle East, which is, of course, a very dry, hot area. We see it in India, which has a very large population, and demand for water is a big piece of this when there's tensions over a limited water supply. Uh, in Northern Africa, in the Sahel, uh, it's conflicts between farmers and pastoralists because, again, in part, population is growing, uh, the water resource is fixed, we're increasingly putting up fences where pastoralists used to migrate. All of those different factors are involved. And now when you add climate change on top of that, it makes many of these problems worse. Uh, climate change raises temperature, that increases demand for water. Climate change causes more extreme events like extreme floods and extreme droughts. That puts pressure on water resources. So it's sort of a perfect storm. Uh, we see all sorts of tensions rising over water anyway, and now we're adding climate change on top of that problem. And, and uh, well, interestingly, your report on the last um, uh, 10 years um, is, is disturbing, but as well as looking backwards, um, you, you're also looking forward. Um, we've reported on Pacific Institute as being one of the partners in developing a new water peace and security tool, which, uh, which I guess future casts looking at machine analysis of um, water availability patterns, climate um, conflict data, and, and you're actually looking forward to what's where this water conflict is going to be. Um, in, in the future, as, as uh, to a level of granularity of even talking about um, the next um, 12 months, um, I, I, I don't think you're predicting great improvements in that period. No, that's right. It's, it's, there's not a lot of good news out there. And so let me describe that a little bit. We're part of something called the Water, Peace and Security Partnership, which is a, a number of organizations around the world, the Pacific Institute, the World Resources Institute in Washington and offices elsewhere, IHE Delft in the Netherlands, Adelphi in Germany. Uh, the, the Pacific Institute looks at the history, the tensions, the causes, the data around water conflicts. But, but if you think about it for a minute, really what's important is figuring out what causes these kinds of conflicts and then figuring out solutions to the conflicts. And so our database looks at the history. The Pacific Institute tries to look at why these conflicts are occurring, where they're occurring. But this partnership as a whole has been trying to develop this tool that might let us peer a little bit into the future to see where the worst tensions are likely to arise, where the combination of hydrology and climate change and population dynamics and political tensions might come together to cause the kinds of conflicts we're seeing. And the reason we're doing that is really because that might give us an opportunity to step in and think about the kinds of solutions we want to apply to limit or prevent or reduce the risk of conflict. Uh, of course, the, the bad news is that the places where we've seen conflict tend to be, in our model estimation, the places where we're likely to see more conflicts, uh, the Middle East, uh, where water is scarce and political tensions are already very high. Uh, the Sahel, where, again, we've seen severe droughts, severe competition for water resources. India and Southern Asia, where the tensions are actually between farmers and growing cities for a fixed, limited amount of water resources. Um, but the model also gives little hints about other places where we might want to look in advance uh, to think about ways of preventing violence over water. Well, well tell us about this. Um, you know, looking beyond the, 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 the usual geographical culprits, I mean, we've also seen, for example, a conflict over um, water infrastructure in Ukraine is what is an example um, that, that springs to mind. But when you and I perhaps talk in 10 years time and, and um, Pacific Institute has produced its data for the last um, 10 years, what, what are we going to see that's, um, that's new in, um, in, in best case and worst case scenarios? 
Well, well, let me step back for a moment. And I, I talked a little bit about the three different kinds of conflicts we're seeing, where water is a trigger of conflict. Uh, that's an issue where scarcity is important. And we have pretty good information about the water resources of all of the different regions around the world. Uh, climate and weather models are beginning to give us more and more forward information about where droughts may be occurring. Uh, that kind of information helps us think about scarcity in the coming months and the coming years. Uh, and again, we see places like parts of South America, <clears throat> excuse me, which, which might experience more and more tensions over scarcity of water. Southern Asia, of course, China, the countries that share the rivers that come off the Himalayas, the Mekong, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, the Salween, uh, all of those are increasingly going to be affected by climate change. Uh, and they serve billions of people. Uh, those are all regions of concern. You mentioned the Ukraine. The Ukraine is a different story. The Ukraine is an example of uh, a conflict that starts not because of water, uh, but because of political tensions between Russia and the Ukraine, but where water resource systems have been targets of conflict. Those are much harder to predict, of course. You have to have a better understanding of global politics or regional politics where there might be a regional conflict that, that we have very difficult time predicting, uh, but where water then becomes a target during conflicts that, that start. Uh, so we're a little better at thinking about scarcity. We're not very good yet at all thinking about future political violence. Would, would you, Peter, you've been at the, the forefront of um, spreading the word and, and, and sounding the alarm bells around um, climate change. And we're talking particularly today about um, water related um, human conflict. There, there does seem to be a sea change, is that the right word, um, around public and political understanding of um, climate change and the, um, the, the uh, need to mitigate and adapt to, um, to, to climate change impacts, the, the Greta Thunberg effect. I think um, there, there's less social, um, public, political awareness of where the, the, the rubber really um, hits the road and it, it's the headline stuff that your research is showing us um, that uh, water-related human conflict um, is uh, is spiking. Uh, when, am I wrong, or do you detect greater political awareness of this as a, as a challenge for our species? Uh, no, I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, I've been working on climate and water issues for three decades, and. In general, I'm an optimist, but it's been a long time that we've known as the scientific community that humans were going to cause climate change, then observing that humans are causing climate change with a, dis a depressing, distressing, small amount of awareness by the political community. Uh, and I do think that's changing. And I think it's changing for two reasons. Uh, one is, or three reasons or more. For, first of all, the science is just unambiguous. Every National Academy of Science on the planet, every professional scientific organization agrees that we are already, we humans are already changing the climate, that we can see that all around us. Uh, so the science has always been very strong, but it's stronger than ever. That's one reason. Another reason is that people everywhere are beginning to see for themselves the impacts of climate change. We're seeing the more extreme storms. We're seeing the horrible fires in California and Australia and elsewhere. We're seeing, you use the term sea change, it's ironically a great term. Uh, we're seeing rising sea levels and coastal storms and acidification of the oceans. Farmers are seeing that things are changing around the world. Um, and those observations themselves are helping the public become more aware of these things. And then we have people like Greta Thunberg, who has just done an unbelievably fantastic job as part of the youth movement to raise awareness of, for all of the rest of us around the world of both the reality of climate change and the failure of our politicians to deal with this. And so the good news is we are seeing more awareness. We are seeing more political organizations and politicians accepting that this is a reality, even in the United States, which, which I would note has been terrible about this. 
all of the Democratic political candidates for president now have raised that issue themselves more than the media has asked them about it. They are pushing this this issue ahead because they understand how important it is. And that awareness is good news to me. Uh, we're, we're way behind the curve here. We're, we're too late in preventing some of the worst impacts of climate change now, but we have to step up to reduce our emissions and to prepare for those changes that we can no longer avoid. It, it's fascinating um, stuff, um, Dr. Glick, and keep up the good work. We uh, will come back to you um, uh, to, to, to hear your views on um, an evolving and, and stressful um, situation about water-related conflict. Um, we will um, provide links to everything discussed in our conversation today for our readers and viewers. And thank you very much for making time to join us. Well, I appreciate your effort to bring this issue to the greater awareness of everybody. It's a very important topic. The Water Diplomat and Uska News will certainly continue to watch this interesting space. Thank you so much for making time to join us today, Dr. Peter Glick.